Good day, everybody. I'm Kevin Hogan, author of uh, 25 books, been translated into 43 languages. Some of those titles would be Covert Persuasion, uh, Psychology of Persuasion, Science of Influence, and Pre-Manipulation, just released. Uh, Pre-Manipulation, Persuasion, and uh, Influence in the Age of Pre-Manipulation. It's pretty cool. So today, today, one persuasion strategy that never fails almost literally or literally out you tell me so quite often you meet with somebody who is going to be difficult okay they're going to be difficult and challenging in some way and so you want a way that you can communicate with them to where they will guide themselves to the correct answer and that is exactly what exegetical persuasion is because exegesis just means that you're taking out of something someone what the right answer is instead of eisegesis which is you're putting something in and you're saying this is what you believe and that's what the answer that you want is okay so exegetical persuasion we're taking it out of them and they're telling us so there's a really simple process for this influence people always say well Kev what, what do you think about objections and what do you in my mind, they're not real. They don't exist. I, seriously, because like if you, you do ex exegetical persuasion, then it's pretty, it's pretty difficult to object to. Why? Here's why. It's the process. And if you have a good process, you win. If you have a great process, you essentially almost always win. Things can happen in life. So the first thing I want you to know and write down, because this is the big one, is that you don't talk yet. Okay, you will say hello and goodbye, all right? Or you'll have a nice conversation, but you won't have anything to talk about as far as business or anything like that. Your business, certainly, or the product or service or you or whatever. What you wanna know in question one or in step one is, is what is it that are the disadvantages of the status quo? So, say that you like that girl over there. Say that she's sort of semi-involved with somebody else. She's just dated somebody and you're curious and you want to know, so like, what is it? You're, you're here with me tonight. So there's something about the other guy that is not so exciting, amazing, fascinating, interesting. What is that? Okay. Or that you use another lawn service. What is it about that lawn service that has caused you to put me in front of you? Like, what aren't you happy with over there? And maybe they'll tell you five things they're happy with. That's happy with. That's all great. But we want to know what they're not happy with ultimately. So they tell you what the disadvantages of um, are of the status quo. And then your next thing is that is simple. Is you just simply say, is that going to continue? Is it likely to continue? Are they likely to be a jerk? Are they likely to do a bad job on the lawn? Are they likely to cut it to where all the way you can see the mud and the dirt? Like you can tell, I've seen this, right? So, so there it is. And, and so that's number one. Okay. So the very first thing you write down is the disadvantages and the pessimism for the status quo. And you simply find it by asking for a question. You would never say your opinion of it because your opinion in exegetical persuasion doesn't matter. All that matters is, is that you put the person through a process that is incredibly comfortable to them. You are sitting in front of this person, in front of this date or in front of this uh, um, uh, potential client or in front of the company or in front of the audience or whatever you're doing here, you want to find out what the disadvantages are to the status quo and the pessimism for it continuing. You want to hear that. You want to hear those words because you'll need those later on. Number two, the, what would the advantages be of changing? Like if you switched lawn service, like what, what would you anticipate on getting out of that? And they'll say, well, you know, we would want somebody who wouldn't cut our lawn beyond, you know, three inches in, in height, you know, to the ground, to zero. We'd like to keep it right at three inches, right about there. That's how long it's supposed to be, Kev. Oh, okay. So, so what are the advantages of change? What are the advantages of moving on? All right. So, so you're with the, the, the date over there and you say, okay, so, so he, he or she is not so great, but what, what would you like to see potentially happen that would be better? 
you know, like what would the upside be? Well, the upside would be I'd be with somebody that was nice, that cared about kids, that loved me, that was interested, and so on. And you get the list and you write notes. Of course, you always, always, always take notes. Here, I'm just gonna cut this to the chase for you. Smart people write down things on pieces of paper. They have it forever. If they wanna put it in their computer where they'll never see it again, that's fine, okay? But always, always take notes. Taking notes means you're the psychologist that cares. You're the medical doctor that cares. If somebody looks at you for 45 minutes and just takes no notes, they will remember nothing. You can't remember more than one minute of dialogue of the last two hour uh, movie that you saw. If you're super smart and paid super close attention and got really into it, you could remember two minutes. Okay, but you, nobody is smart enough to remember that much information and then use it in some way. So stop being like all these other people out here. Start taking notes. It really matters, especially in exegesis. When you're doing something as simple as this process, you're going to get tons of information of which you can't remember any of it. You'll remember, they'll give you four reasons the status quo stinks. They'll give you five reasons for change. Can I list nine things to you in change? Really? Okay, my phone number, one 9524657525 What was that? You gotta go back and rewind it because you didn't write it down. All right, if you put it in your computer, where's it gonna go? You're gonna, like, I think there was a nine in there, right? Okay, so we don't do that anymore. We go and be intelligent instead, always, always. Number three, optimism for change, okay? The pessimism uh, for the status quo has to be balanced off with the optimism for change as well as the advantages for change. It can't be just that the future is going to be better under your under this person's idea. Now, granted, if this was your idea, you would need way more advantages, way more upside, way more uh, optimism, but they're giving you the answer. So, okay, so are you feeling good? Like, is this really likely to change? Will you really likely get a better lawn service that actually will follow your directions? If you hire us, what's going to happen? If you bring us in as a speaker, as an event, are you really going to have better results? Why is it that people kept coming to Influence Bootcamp over the years? What, what's, what's the reason? They come back and they come back and they come back. Maybe they didn't get anything the first time. Probably not. That's where you go to somebody else's event. No, you come back when you keep getting more and more and more and great distinctions and fine tuning and, and better answers and solutions. Number four, you want the intention for change. Say, okay, so let me, let, and this is where you can actually make a quick summary. All right, so clearly this guy over here is a jerk and you need something a little bit better. And you do see that you, it's obvious that you're looking for some other results in life, which is a smart thing, obviously. And uh, you feel pretty good about it, but when will you actually make the change? Like, how are you going to decide that? How are you going to decide when to make the change? How, how, not why, why is good. We already know why though, because the guy is a jerk or the company's a jerk or your last speaker sucked or your, your last uh, um, trainer was no trainer at all, you, you know, because everybody's a life coach, right? So you want intention for change. Like what is the, what is the intention for change here? Why, it's not just why, it's what. It's what and how is it going to happen? All right, and when are you going to make it happen? That's the intention. So, okay, so great. So you're going to say goodbye to this person when? Because I certainly wouldn't be interested in stepping on their feet, whether they're a jerk or a good person. When are you gonna hire a new lawn service? Uh, well, we could probably take you on today. Okay, great, here you go. You can sign this, all right? They will pull out the little iPad and you sign it right there. That's a signature, by the way, that's a good thing. So that's ex exegetical persuasion, the four-step process. There are three little things to remember after this that are pretty important, so write them down. First, develop the ability to figure out the solution with the client. So in other words, if they're having a hard time with any of these four steps, it means they really don't know how to think clearly and they think well enough to have selected that person or that company over there, which means not so amazing, right? Now, the next thing is then is they want feelings and experiences as well, right? They don't just want a good lawn service. They want something that is going to, they want they want an experience that is going to feel good. Like the guy comes up at the end of the day, says, okay, will you check out your lawn for me or am I good? 
well, that gives them a choice, right? They feel good about that option. Like I could be involved, but I don't have to be, all right? That's pretty smart. Or they can, um, they can want to have new feelings with that new person that they're with over there. That's pretty important too. What were the feelings that they experienced when interacting with the old person? Okay, that they were with, or the old company that they were doing business with, or their old um, uh, training company that they were with, or whoever, however this all works and plays together. And finally, why did you come to me to present at this event? Or why did you come to me? Why did you stop and talk to me? I'll tell you that story sometime. There's some good stories there. But why did you come and stop and talk to me instead of like all these other people here? You could have talked to anybody, these people. And I'm just curious, why did you come and stop and talk to me? These are the seven pieces of exegetical persuasion. Check that and make it eight. Don't talk when they're talking. You're asking questions. If you talk to them, if, you, if you're there for a one hour appointment and you have about um, 45 minutes of conversation about their family, their friends, what they've been doing lately, how things are going in life, what's happening, the difficulties, and then you do the first, the process of exegetical persuasion is really about a five minute process. And then the remaining three tips takes another two or three minutes to wrap it up that's your hour. You say perhaps 10% of the words and you let them communicate the other 90%. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kevin Hogan. I will see you here next time.